at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wooten. Tonight, the brave Tory rebels may have lost the battle against nonsensical Plan B restrictions, but they may well win the war as they send shockwaves through number 10 and secure concessions from the PM on opposition to mandatory vaccination. We'll be live from Westminster, then I'll have analysis in my digest and get the view of my superstar panel, Daily Star columnist Dawn Neeson, conservative commentator Gavin Robinson, and journalist and author Rebecca Reed. Could Boris Johnson's persistence with dangerous and freedom-destroying vaccine passports really be the beginning of the end of his downfall? Nigel Farage gives his uncompromising take on a divided Conservative Party in What the Farage. As the government threatens to go beyond Plan B and impose devastating new restrictions on a hospitality industry already on its knees, should those businesses be exempt from potentially fatal COVID laws? Chef and restaurateur Aldo Zilli, like so many of us, is livid. And he'll go head to head with Professor in Medical Microbiology Sally Jane Cutler in The Clash. Some predictions suggest the mild Omicron variant could soon infect half a million Brits a day. So has the time come for us to finally just accept that we need to shield the vulnerable while the rest of us are left to go on with our lives? Stanford Medical Professor Jay Bhattacharya, co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, is uncancelled tonight to explain why the government should focus on our strengths in the battle against COVID rather than scaremongering and ostracising the unvaccinated. Netflix, well, it's revolutionised the way we consume entertainment, hasn't it? But how have they orchestrated this meteoric rise from online rental store to a multi-billion dollar company winning the streaming wars? Netflix co-founder Mark Randolph joins me live from California at 10.20. This is exciting news today. Darren Grimes has officially joined the GB News family. And tonight he'll join me to discuss his brand new show, Real Britain, before weighing in on the Omicron hysteria in The Outsider at 9.45. Will vaccine travel passports for 12 to 15 year olds save Christmas holidays or are they simply a weapon to ramp up the pressure for child jabs? Plus, after a heartless postman was sacked for shamefully ignoring a pensioner who had slipped in the snow, should you be punished for failing to be a good Samaritan? My panel will weigh in on those topics and more stories of the day in the media buzz. And as ever, we'll bring you a first look at tomorrow's newspaper front pages and crown a new Greatest Britain and Union Jackass before the end of the show. This is Dan Wilson tonight. Let's go. Just one thing first, though, and breaking tonight, a massive Tory rebellion against Plan B, specifically the introduction of vaccine passports, has put the Prime Minister Boris Johnson under huge pressure. 99 Conservative MPs are believed to have rebelled, including Mark Harper, who will, be, who will be joined by very shortly. And they rebelled even though the terrible laws were nodded through by the limp Labour Party led by an even limper leader of no opposition, Keir Starmer. Here's how the three key votes broke down. The use of face coverings in most indoor settings in England passed by a majority of 400 with 41 voting against. The introduction of COVID-19 certificates 
that's vaccine passports, come on for, for events and large venues, passed by a majority of 243 with 126 votes against, including a massive 99 Tories. And MPs voted in favour of making coronavirus vaccines for frontline workers mandatory, with a majority of 285. Let's head straight now to our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, at a shell-shocked Westminster. Darren, this was Boris Johnson's worst nightmare, right? Thought it might be, might be 80. As you say, it was 99 in the end. The biggest rebellion Boris Johnson has faced as leader. But even in historic context, this is a big, big rebellion by the backbench MPs against the government, defying the government and indeed the Prime Minister tonight. Largely, these MPs are drawn from across the party as well, Dan. They are committee chairs. They are 90, 2019 intake. They are former uh, leadership contenders, all pretty angry with Boris Johnson, feeling that the vaccine passport was a line that they could not cross. Now, in the end, the Prime Minister won. It is now law, but only with the help of the Labour Party. No government wants to be in a position of having to rely on Her Majesty's opposition. Where does this leave Boris Johnson? Well, undoubtedly damaged, his authority weakened. The big question, though, is going forward. If he wants to impose more restrictions, that has got a hell of a lot more difficult. The Prime Minister promising the Parliament would be recalled first before any new restrictions. And you bet you there might even be a bigger rebellion against that. Well, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor, on what has become a monumental day at Westminster. Thank you so much, Darren. I'll have a digest on this coming up in just a moment. Then we'll cross to Westminster again and be joined by Mark Harper, one of the Tory rebels and chair of the COVID recovery group. Plus, my superstar panel weigh in. Let's have a look at them. It's the former editor of the Daily Star current columnist, Dawn Neeson, the Conservative commentator, Calvin Robinson, and the journalist and author, Rebecca Reed. But before a very busy show, the news with Polly Middlehurst. Good evening. Your latest news headlines. We've just been hearing about the COVID restrictions vote in the Commons. Elsewhere, the First Minister of Scotland says she's not cancelling Christmas. Instead, Nicola Sturgeon is asking people to limit their socialising to a maximum of three households during the holiday period. She says Omicron must be taken seriously, warning it will do untold damage on businesses and critical services if action isn't taken now. Turning to Christmas Day specifically, or Christmas Eve or Boxing Day, or whenever you have your main family celebration, we are not asking you to cancel or change your plans, and we are not proposing limits on the size of household gatherings. Keeping your celebrations as small as your family circumstances allow is sensible too. Make sure everyone in your gathering is vaccinated and has done a test in advance. Keep rooms ventilated and follow strict hygiene rules. Well, the government is now appealing for tens of thousands of volunteers to help them with the booster jab programme. It announced a target of nearly one million jabs every day to get all eligible adults vaccinated by the end of December. But the former NHS Trust chairman Ron Lilly told GB News that's unrealistic. Just to suddenly on Sunday night say, oh, listen, and by the way, on Monday we're going to do a million vaccinations. Oh, no, we're not. Uh, you know, we've got to recruit the... Uh, the volunteers with the estates people have got to sort out the locations, there's security, there's clinical waste, there's logistics. I mean, this is a big operation, and I'm not saying the NHS isn't up for it. It is. But if you simply do the numbers, the carryover of the unvaccinated into the next day, it's just statistically impossible to do by the end of the month. In other news, the Prime Minister has described the murder of 16-month-old Star Hobson in West Yorkshire as shocking and heartbreaking. Boris Johnson also says lessons need to be learned and children must be protected from what he called these barbaric crimes. Savannah Brockhill, pictured on the right, was convicted of murdering the toddler. Her partner and Star's mother, Frankie Smith, on the left, has been found guilty of causing or allowing the death of a child. Star's great-grandfather says he saw worrying signs of abuse in the family. My blood used to run cold. I just had a horrible, uneasy feeling about the situation. We even called the car Christine after a horror film in the early 80s. And then Anita used to say, 
you do realise little Frank, little star's going to finish up a star in the sky. I kept seeing Frankie bruised and it was just like a, a domestic relationship. Star Hobson's great-grandfather. Now, Malta has become the first European country to approve the personal use of cannabis. The law, approved by 36 votes to 27, allows adults to possess up to seven grams of marijuana and grow up to four plants at home. The country's equality minister says the move will ensure a safe and regularised way of obtaining the substance. You're right up to date. Now back to Dan Wooden and tonight. Tonight, I salute the brave Tory rebels. While the pathetic leader of no opposition, Keir Starmer, made their vote against the government meaningless in terms of stopping the anti-freedom, anti-evidence-based Plan B measures, including dreaded vaccine passports and mask mandates, their united voice has shaken Downing Street to its core tonight. Two years on from a landslide election, many of the MPs who backed Boris Johnson's brilliant Brexit strategy have rightly turned on it over his calamitous, hysterical COVID-19 policies. But the 99 Conservatives who put their morality, value system and common sense ahead of personal ambition have made a difference. Both the Prime Minister and the Health Secretary made two significant concessions to the Freedom Fighters in a bid to avoid an even bigger rebellion. Crucially, Boris Johnson has pledged he will end plans for his awful national conversation on mandatory vaccination, which would have torn both his party and the entire country apart. And awful vaccine passports will always come with the option of providing a negative lateral flow test. But rightly, the Tory rebels were prepared to become the country's only opposition tonight because of a complete lack of evidence for the measures being introduced, as well as a failure of learning to live with COVID, as the government has long promised. Their speeches in the House of Commons were stirring. Mr Speaker. Yeah. In a typical winter's day, between 200 people and 350 people will die of flu. Do we hide behind our masks? Do we lurk at home, working from home? Do we demand that people prov provide their bona fides before going to a, a venue? Do we require people to be vaccinated as a condition of keeping their jobs? The question is whether the, the measures before us today are proportionate actually comes down to a matter of opinion. My third reason for voting against COVID passports today is the fundamental unease they give me. We do not discriminate on a medical basis in this country, yeah, yeah. and we cannot. Secondly, we are encouraging people to work from home, but pub trips or parties are permitted when we know from the previous uh, lockdowns that it was home mixing where the problem was. We have very high vaccination rates. We do not need these passports. 96% of people in Rutland and Melton have had both their jabs. 93, sorry, 96% have had their first. 93% of Rutland and Melton have had their second. 47% of people have had their boosters. They deserve to be thanked and recognised, and my constituents do not deserve to have to have passports put upon them when they are taking up the vaccine like this. And on this point, I have supported the government throughout the pandemic when I could see the present danger we faced. But this time around, the measures proposed are precautionary, just in case, and I cannot see where this will end. COVID will be with us for many years to come, and it's unthinkable that every autumn from now on, we will be limiting the quality of life for all citizens just to be on the safe side. I'm very disappointed that we've very quickly gone into um, panic and emergency mode with late night Sunday night broadcasts, not in the House of Commons where questions can be asked, frankly scaring people witless mm -hmm. uh, and telling them, for example, that two doses don't give you any protection, which is of course not true. Two doses have weakened protection with Omicron against infection, but actually still very good protection against serious disease. And I'm concerned there are many people out there who will have had two doses, who are perhaps vulnerable, who now feel they have no protection, which is simply not correct. 
Mark Harper, who will join me in just a moment, from Westminster. But here is the list of all those brave MPs who voted against vaccine passports tonight. And thank you to all of them for doing what I pleaded of them in the Digest last night. They voted for liberty, for freedom. They voted in favour of the evidence. They voted to stop a two-tier society and to halt the march of the sage maniacs taking control of our lives again. They voted for the right of the individual to decide what they wear, who they meet and where they go. And they voted for what they know is right. But sadly, the fight to learn to live with COVID in the UK is only just beginning. That odd little COVID oppressor in Scotland, you know I call her scheming sturgeon. Well, she was back today and she was back telling Scots how many people they can socialise with over Christmas. We are not banning or restricting household mixing in law as before. We understand the negative impact this has on mental health and wellbeing. But we are asking everyone, and we will issue strong guidance to this effect, to cut down as far as possible the number of people outside our own households that we are interacting with just now. This will help break transmission chains. So my key request today is this, before and immediately after Christmas, please minimise your social mixing with other households as much as you can. However, if you do plan on socialising, either at home or in indoor public places, we are asking that you limit the number of households represented in your group to a maximum of three and make sure you test before you go. Yes, Queen Nicola, of course. She just loves the control, doesn't she? And in Westminster, plans are already being drawn up for new restrictions on the hospitality industry. That could see limits in pubs and restaurants or even their closure and the return of the furlough scheme just to further the bankrupt of the country. Why not? A government source disturbedly told The Sun, you will be able to see your family at Christmas, but at this rate, you might not be able to do it in a pub. As for New Year's Eve, that is a different story. And the health secretary says there are no guarantees that schools will stay open. All this despite Dr Angelique Cortez, the South African GP who, who first blew the lid on Omicron, insisting the UK's response verges on hysteria. Writing in the Daily Mail today, she said, I can reassure you that the symptoms presenting in those with Omicron are very, very mild compared with those we see with the far more dangerous Delta variant. Indeed, I am disappointed by such knee-jerk reactions they bear no relation to what we're seeing in surgeries in South Africa, where people rarely even discuss Omicron. As one Twitter user commented, COVID's become a UK neurosis. Boris talks tough in private about refusing to lock down ever again, but his actions make that hard to believe, especially given the pressure he constantly comes under from Witty, Valance, Ferguson and Sage. The Tory rebels who voted against Plan B today are now the country's official opposition. And boy, oh boy, we need them. Joining me now, live from Westminster, is the former Conservative Chief Whip and Chair of the COVID Recovery Group, Mark Harper. He is one of those Tory rebels. Mark Harper, do you think Boris Johnson, a man who I've supported a lot in the past, and I know you have too, will finally get the message tonight? We have to learn to live with COVID. Well, Dan, I very much hope so. I mean, what I was trying to do uh, tonight was partly to, to send a message on these specific measures. And I set out in the House of Commons, I think has been represented in your report, that I'm very disappointed that in a country which is one of the best protected countries in the world by vaccination, we very quickly went into a, a panic and emergency mode rather than dealing with this difficulty in a more calm and measured way. Uh, I think that's been very unhelpful, and I think you've reflected that very well in your report. But coming to, to your question specifically, look, the Prime Minister got a very clear message this evening from uh, around 100 Conservative MPs that they want things done differently. They want Parliament taken seriously. They want to make sure that if he does bring measures forward, that, that Parliament is involved, that we're, if necessary, recalled from our Christmas recess, ministers lay out the evidence in Parliament so it can be challenged and questions can be asked. Um, and, and I think that's really important and I hope he changes his ways. Uh, we can do things so much better uh, in the way the government is run 
uh, and I hope that's what we achieve. And, you know, the, the disappointing thing is that the job of, you know, opposition, and that doesn't mean necessarily voting against things, but it's the job of the Labour Party to ask yeah. questions, to challenge the government and to insist it brings forward evidence. And they've made it quite clear, even without seeing any further measures, that they'll basically vote for them. And they're just giving the government a blank cheque. And that doesn't lead to good government. Challenging and holding ministers to account is how you get good government. And that's what I and a number of my colleagues will continue to do. Mark, do you share my fears that it feels like we're on a march towards some form of January lockdown, whether officially or by stealth? Well, I, I am concerned about that, um, and it's, it's one of the things I set out in, in my speech uh, today in Parliament. We, we've got to learn how to live with this virus. It's not going away. There are some people, I understand why, who feel that if you know, we just wait a little bit longer, it'll be sort of over. But it's not going to be over. Covid's going to be with us forever. The chief scientific advisor said that. Uh, variants are going to be with us forever, and every time we get a variant of concern, we cannot go into an emergency mode where we scare people, where we effectively shut down sectors of the economy um, by, by the back door. Um, we can't do that. It's not economically sustainable. It's not socially sustainable. And also, we're just about to do a whole load of damage to the NHS again because we're, we know we're going to cancel a lot of operations. A lot of appointments with GPs are going to get cancelled for this focus on the booster programme. Now, it may be the right decision. I'm not sure what balancing has been done, but we're just about to create another backlog that's going to have to be dealt with. And I don't know whether you know, doing all of that in order to, to give boosters to 20 and 30 year olds is actually the right decision. And we've not heard any evidence spelt out in Parliament about what ministers have balanced on that equation, how they've reached that decision. I want to hear more about that. Um, and frankly, we're going to learn more about Omicron probably every day of the next week or so. And the idea that we're going to break up on Thursday and, and go away for the Christmas recess for two weeks, I, I think is ridiculous. And I want ministers to commit that Parliament should be sitting uh, if there are going to be decisions taken and information to be shared with members of Parliament. Well, Mark Harper, you're now one of the leaders of the unofficial opposition. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for rebelling tonight, that is Mark Harper, chair of the COVID Recovery Group, former Tory chief whip. Let me bring in my superstar panel now. They're with me all night. The columnist at the Daily Star, Dawn Neeson, the conservative commentator, Calvin Robinson, and the journalist and author, Rebecca Reed. Dawn, let me start with you. I know all of these measures were nodded through tonight, but it feels like a significant moment because Boris Johnson now knows he cannot take the Tory party for granted. Good. And every single one of those MPs who rebelled today is an absolute hero in my book. That was democracy in action. Where we are before this is not. Boris is not a democratic leader. I don't know whose tune is dancing to, whether it's Sage or his wife or a combination of both. But it, it is not democracy. This is not where... And it's interesting that Mark just then said, you know, every variant of concern. Dan, this isn't even a variant of concern. It's maybe a variant to celebrate Calvin Robinson. Exactly. Well, it's... yeah, it seems like a natural vaccine, doesn't it? If it's yes. very well spreading, but very weak and mild in symptoms. But I also want to echo what Dawn just said and thank every mm. single one of those rebel MPs mm. that voted against this. And it's, it's funny that I'm trying to get my head around the ones that voted for the vaccine passport, especially the Conservative MPs, because if they did, either they believe in vaccine passports, in which case they're not Conservative, or they're more concerned about their career prospects and their ambitious goals than climbing the slippery pole. I have a option feeling you've just got option it. Option B. Rebecca Reed, let's talk about Omicron because the doctor, the South African doctor, Angelique Cortese, mm. who discovered the whole thing, blew the lid on the whole thing, has done a great favour to the world, actually says further restrictions could do a massive disservice to the UK because this is a variant we should be celebrating and she believes the ticket is herd immunity. If a million people a day are getting this variant, it could spell the end of COVID and we should be celebrating it. I think that's entirely possible, though I would like to see a little bit more... So I, I have a feeling, you may be right, but I'd like to see a little bit more evidence that you are. But I think what's different at the moment is that we are currently 11 days or 10 days from Christmas or 11 days from Christmas. So if you get it now, you can't really go home. And I think for a lot of people, that is the that's main concern. That's going to be devastating. It's the fact that we are trying to just avoid getting ill before Christmas. I think you will find that in January, a lot of people will go, eh, I'm probably going to get it at some point. 
never mind. But I think it's just this period where people are very frightened of getting ill and then mm. not being able to see their families, which is a very reasonable thing to do and a reasonable thing to be worried about. Indeed. Well, look, we're going to tackle all angles of this COVID crisis, or you might say the crisis in terms of the response to this pandemic throughout the show with my superstar panel, Rebecca Reed, Carmen Robinson, Dawn Neeson. Do stand by. But also coming up, could vaccine passports come back to bite Boris and the Labour Party who waved them through this evening? TV News star Nigel Farage has his say in What the Farage soon. But next, isn't it time we acted to save the hospitality industry by making exempt from more COVID restrictions? Professor of Microbiology Sally Jane Cutler battles out with celebrity chef Aldo Zilli in what I'm sure is going to be a very fiery crash next. But... As ever, I want to know what you think. Tweet me and vote in my poll at GB News on Twitter. And don't forget to email me your thoughts to dan at gbnews.uk. I'll share the best of them after the break. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi there, welcome to the latest forecast. There'll be a lot of cloud during the next 24 hours, shrouding the hills of the western UK and keeping things mild. There'll be some rain as well, but that will tend to ease later as this area of high pressure moves in for the rest of the week and begins to properly settle things down widely. Before that happens, these weather fronts and these tightly packed isobars across northern parts of the UK bring wind and rain for Tuesday evening. Some heavier rain at times for the northwest highlands, but through the night, the area of cloud and rain across Scotland sinks south. It clears from the far north and northwest, but it edges into Northern Ireland, parts of Northern England as well. It stays cloudy across southern areas, but through this slice of central UK, clearer spells and perhaps a few pockets of fog first thing. A chilly start here as well. And once the fog clears, plenty of sunshine emerging across parts of North and East Wales, the Midlands, Eastern England. Also turning brighter to the north of the central belt, some decent sunshine here and less windy compared to Tuesday. Otherwise, a lot of cloud cover, some light outbreaks of rain and drizzle, more persistent damp weather for parts of Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland and Northwest England. And this area of cloud and outbreaks of rain starts to move north once again on Wednesday evening pushing into the rest of Scotland eventually overnight. Meanwhile, it stays mostly cloudy across Wales, southern and southwest England. But for the Midlands, eastern England, southern Scotland, clear spells, which will lead to, in some places, frost and even fog to begin things on Thursday. Once any fog clears, though, the best of any sunny spells will be across eastern Scotland, southern Scotland, northern and eastern England. Generally cloudy skies elsewhere. The rain in the far north of Scotland eases through the day so that by the afternoon actually many places are dry, but it will turn a bit colder. High pressure is extending across the whole of the UK on Thursday and Friday. It will bring a lot of cloud, but it will also turn things colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. 
and something else. I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Welcome back. Nigel Farage and Darren Grimes both on the way, but time now for The Clash. Our hospitality industry has suffered hugely at the hands of draconian COVID restrictions after being forced to close their doors. Most restaurants were operated at a reduced capacity for large parts of the pandemic. Remember the rule of six? That 10 p.m. curfew and Michael Gove's scotch egg rule. And even when they are open, they are vulnerable to the government's constant scaremongering. The Nighttime Industries Association has warned that businesses face 12 days of Christmas misery this year because of the government's hysterical public health messaging in the last few weeks. And that's before any more crippling restrictions like pub passports and social distancing are imposed. So isn't it about time we looked after the businesses and workers of a hospitality industry already on its knees and make hospitality exempt from any more restrictions? As always, I'd love to get your verdict. You can vote in our poll on Twitter at GB News. Drop me your emails as well. But first, to debate this, maybe they'll help you make your mind up, we have celebrity chef and restaurateur Aldo Zilli and the professor of microbiology, Sally Jane Cutler. Aldo, I mean, I don't think your industry can take any more restrictions. A lot of restaurants and pubs simply will not survive it. Well... I'm quite surprised that we survived as long as we have. And as we're just getting back on our feet, um, this has come as a shock to everyone the last week or so. Uh, this new variant is, is um, spreading like fire, apparently. Uh, well, it is. I feel very sorry for everybody that's lost people in the pandemic. I, for one, I've got a brother in induced coma in Italy at the moment because he oh, didn't believe God. in vaccines. Sorry to um, hear that, Aldo. So vaccine uh, is a must. The third one, uh, apparently, especially now, is more important than ever. But closing the hospitality industry again uh, will cause havoc. It will cause uh, a lot of people out of work, uh, a lot of mental health problems. And of course, you know, the government uh, is going to have to pay all those people that are going to be out of work again. Uh, it's not, a, I don't think it's even a conversation, even thinking about closing the hospitality industry. Restaurants and pubs, um, I can understand. I mean, I went to London the other day. I was, um, I didn't have a space to sit in an underground. I was on top of, everybody was on top of me. So, what, what's the difference when you when you're thinking of when you're thinking of these kind of things and you're thinking of people going to uh, big events? Maybe you know uh, the the again the passport for me is a waste of time as well because we're gonna we, apparently we're gonna vaccinate everybody by the end of the year so that should be enough and we should be grown up enough to understand what the government wants us to do and do it. Exactly, so uh, but follow should, guidance stop, because the, the impact on your treated, industry, treated yeah, totally. And the impact on your industry, Aldo, is very severe. I've just been sent uh, a message or, or an Instagram post actually from the chef, Tom Carriage, who has actually yeah. posted saying, 
that one of his restaurants in the past six days has had 654 guests cancel. And he says, before some gammon-faced idiot says, you can afford it, fat lad, yes, I probably can. But this isn't about me or my restaurants. It's about our industry and people's livelihoods. He's right, isn't he? Well, Tom, it's not, you know, he's absolutely spot on. It's not just about one person, one pub. It's about the industry in itself. It's not going to stand. It's, it can't stand. Me, my small industry, where I'm running here from home, We've had party cancels, cancellations, and it's not fair. You know, I mean, it's it's um, people people are being people are getting scared again. That's what the problem is. We we scare. They're scaring. You know, the government is scaring everyone again, so that they stay at home. And then what? You know, they stay at home. They don't go out. We close the restaurants. You know, for how long? I don't know. And uh, January is a bleak month as it is. And the last three weeks hasn't been great because we were told we were told to work from home from Monday. So people have cancelled parties and now Christmas has been bad enough. And come January, the industry is on its knees anyway without the pandemic. January is always a bad month. And if we're closing down, then it's 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 all over. It's no, not very, very good points. Sally Jane Cutler, surely it's not necessary in a population where 95 percent of adults have COVID antibodies, where the vast majority of the population, well over 80 percent, are double jabbed and a growing number of the population are triple jabbed. Surely it's not necessary, Sally Jane Cutler, to shut down entire industries again, or is it? They haven't tried to shut down the hospitality industry. They're trying to actually keep it open, but they're trying to keep it open by advising that people are vaccinated, that they try and go to these various venues in a safe and protected way, such as some... Um, sorry, my cat's trying to join oh, in as well. Come on, show us, show us. What's your, what's your cat's name, Sally J? Hi, um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's beautiful. What a beautiful That's cat. Night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sam, welcome. I think Sam Basically. agrees with me, though. He's annoyed with you, Sally Jane. <laughs> Quite possibly. But she's enjoying the fact that I'm trying to work from home oh, when I can, okay. according to government guidance. Because basically, there is an unprecedented amount of community transmission of this new Omicron variant at this point in time. And but Sally, it's a cold. Know. It's a cold. You must have looked at the evidence from South Africa. It looks like it's but very can mild. We extrapolate that directly from one country to another. We don't know yet. And so this is a precautionary short term measure. We're trying to be proportionate to try and gain some extra information about how severe is this new Omicron variant. I'm sure you've probably seen the data that came from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine over the weekend, predicting between 25,000 and 75,000 Sally, I've got it deaths. wrong every single time. Their modelling should be ignored, in my view, because when has that organisation got it right at any point during this pandemic, Sally Jane? Serious question. We can't gamble with the risk of those kind of figures. But what and about so Aldo's industry? Can you gamble we with Aldo's industry? Time. Can you gamble with hospitality? Can you gamble with pubs? Can you gamble with restaurants? They're going to shut. It's not a permanent thing. It's a temporary measure to buy time so that we can get a greater rollout of booster shots and also okay. so that the vaccine development companies can hopefully have a vaccine that's going to be better tuned to the Omicron variant. Because okay. at the moment, we don't know what kind of duration right. of protection we're going to get. We can't, from the triple we can't survive by keep closing it open. No, well, I hear you both. Thank you so much for having that fascinating clash. That was celebrity chef and restaurateur Aldo Zilli and the professor of microbiology, Sally Jane Cutler, and her beautiful cat. Thank you both. So who do you agree with? Dan, good name on Twitter, says, yes, venues should be exempt, especially the smaller family-run places. I'm pretty sure loyal customers will be willing to distance in these places. They don't deserve to be destroyed by any further draconian restrictions. 
Adam on Twitter says, I'm for masks. Masks should be worn. But other than that, businesses should be free to trade as normal. And Chris via email says the hospitality industry is a vital part of the UK economy that generates a significant contribution in taxes. If the government were serious about protecting the NHS, they would lift all restrictions on the hospitality industry in order to have that revenue. And your verdict is in. 86% of you agree with Aldo Zilli that the hospitality industry should be exempt from COVID restrictions, while 14% of you say they should not be. Coming up, I'll be welcoming the straight-talking Darren Grimes to the GB News family. He'll join me to discuss his brand new show, Real Britain. That was announced today before weighing in on Omicron hysteria in The Outsider. Plus, are vaccine passports for 12 to 15-year-olds necessary for them to learn about the world or a weapon of tyranny? I'll put that to my panel in the media buzz. And we'll bring you the first look at tomorrow's front newspaper front pages. But next, Nigel Farage is here. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Time for What the Farage Now with Nigel. And of course, Boris Johnson has tonight suffered the biggest Conservative rebellion of his premiership as nearly 100 Tory MPs opposed vaccine passports in what will go down as a pretty terrible Commons vote for him. Those brave Tory MPs proved they were the only effective parliamentary opposition, though, as the languid Labour Party helped the government wave through new coercive COVID restrictions, including a mask mandate and mandatory jabs for NHS workers, as well as COVID certification for nightclubs and large events. But Nigel, look, in my view, the big question tonight is with more than a quarter, a quarter of his party voting against his Plan B measures, what does this mean for Boris Johnson? Well, Dan, good evening. And it's, uh, I have to say, a rather happier evening than I thought it was going to be. The last really big rebellion that we had was over Theresa May's sellout to Europe. Um, and when we got to the third time of asking, the Spartans held out, which allowed me to come back with the Brexit party, get rid of Mrs May. Um, so rebellions can be very, very useful. Um, interesting, isn't it? Boris Johnson the third time of asking, supported Mrs May's plan, something that's been lost in the mists of time. Uh, this Not by you, though. News. Not by you. No, no, no. Well, I mean, I've always known my chat wasn't quite straight, as it were. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to politics and, and things. But look, the good news about this rebellion is it makes Plan C politically impossible. You know, I thought we were heading down the road 
of having to show vaccine passports to go to the pub to get a pint. Now, this is something very dear to my heart, Dan, dearer than to most people <laughs> in this country. And I'd already said I wouldn't go to the pub. If I, I heard you say that earlier. I was you shocked. Know? I was Absolutely. shocked. Absolutely, and I really meant it. I really meant it. No so, vaccine passport actually, required for talking pints, right? You were quite. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I really think this is important in that sense, that it's going to be very difficult, impossible, for Johnson to go further in terms of restrictions. So very, very well done, you know, to all of those people that stood up tonight. And I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. I've talked to lots of them over the course of the last few days. I even did a little, little YouTube video this morning saying why you should rebel. So that's good news. Now, your arithmetic, Dan, is flawed, deeply, deeply flawed. Okay. It is not 25%, and I'll tell you why. Because, and I haven't got the precise number, but somewhere between 100 and 150 Conservative MPs are either on the ministerial payroll mm. or have PPS-type positions, which binds them with collective responsibility. Yes. So they could take rebel that number without out, and you're beginning to get to between 40 and 50 percent of those that were free to rebel that did. That is a massive, very significant number. Um, and what it tells you is that it's over for Boris. It's just a question of time. He's lost respect. He's lost authority. He's lost the ability to lead in a crisis. He has panicked the nation. And I mean, I know lots of us are rebelling, but actually lots of people are deeply fearful out there. Hence the running out, you know, of testing kits. Uh, people in the street yesterday, I was walking down the high street shopping without a mask. I mean, you'd have thought, you know, <laughs> that I was the devil. Now that's not how you feel that way, but... <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you, you know, honestly, putting fear into the country is irresponsible. It is wrong. It is not leadership. I'd hate to think of this man as a leader in genuine wartime. He just could not do it. So I think it's significant. I think he's lost control of his parliamentary party. He's lost the respect of the country. Um, and the saddest part of this is that the opposition is not coming in any way at all from the Labour Party. Pathetic. I thought that, I mean, that broadcast by Keir Starmer, oh. you know, protect the NHS, save lives, work from home. And it was just Boris Johnson with a slightly better haircut, <laughs> um, but but not using the word emergency. So, so we're in a funny old place in politics, but I think that a roughly 100 Conservative members of Parliament tonight have stood up for liberty, have stood up for freedom, have stood up for decency. And I tell you what, if I had anything to do with it, they would all be given a jolly good lunch tomorrow <laughs> and a glass of wine, and I'd say, well done. And Without I'm having to show their vaccine tonight. passport. No, look, I, I, I no, agree. No. I agree with all of that, Nigel, but I guess where I probably disagree with you is that I don't get a sense that these rebels actually want Boris to go. What they want is him to lose the hysteria when it comes to COVID. Well, I, I think if you speak to them in private, Dan, as I do, you'd be amazed, actually, how many of them are frankly mutinous. They were elected on a conservative manifesto. They are led by a man who is not conservative in any aspect of what he says or does. Uh, so I know I think it's rather deeper. Uh, than perhaps you're realising. The odd thing is there are no obvious alternatives. There is no. the very corporate, the very corporate Rishi, the utterly untested Liz Truss, <clears throat> and at the moment, no other obvious names in the hat. But, you know, if we go back to 1975, Mrs Thatcher was the most unlikely person to lead a Conservative revolution, and that is now what's needed. Because, you see, Brexit interrupted what had become every party being a social democratic party. They were also, in 2010, you know, when we had Miliband, Clegg and Cameron, we had three social democrat parties. You couldn't put a cigarette paper between yeah. them. I was 
the great disruptor yeah. in the course of that decade. And Brexit, it wasn't just Brexit, but Brexit was the issue. The Conservative Party briefly, reluctantly adopted it for their own survival. But now we're back to the old Etonian gang. Now we're back to the, you know, sort of, sort of metro, liberal, London, greeny elite. And yet I do see some, some grassroots of hope. I think the 2019 intake uh, contains among it some very different people, different backgrounds, different classes, different life experiences, and already they're showing they've got a bit of backbone. They've got a bit of courage. They're not just in politics, this lot, for climbing the greasy pole and for promotion. So I'm beginning to feel that there is the emergence of a political movement that actually wants radical change in terms of how we run, how we're governed, and they will try to win that battle from within the Conservative Party. If they can't win that battle from within the Conservative Party, then you know something? Realignment is possible. Well, you've proven that, Nigel. Fascinating analysis as ever. Thank you so much. I'm heartened uh, by the possibility that this means Plan C is out the window, but I guess we need these Tory rebels to remain firm. Nigel Farage, thank you so much. And of course, Nigel will be back tomorrow night at 7 p.m. here on GB News. Coming up, though, how did Netflix rise from a 30-employee company operating out of a motel to one of the most powerful forces in the media today? The company's co-founder, Mark Randolph, reveals the secrets to birthing a game changer at 10.20. The next is joining the family. The newest GB News star, Darren Grimes, is here and giving it both barrels to the Omicron hysterics. See you in just a moment. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi there, welcome to the latest forecast. There'll be a lot of cloud during the next 24 hours, shrouding the hills of western UK and keeping things mild. There'll be some rain as well, but that will tend to ease later as this area of high pressure moves in for the rest of the week and begins to properly settle things down widely. Before that happens, these weather fronts and these tightly packed isobars across northern parts of the UK bring wind and rain for Tuesday evening. Some heavier rain at times for the northwest highlands, but through the night, the area of cloud and rain across Scotland sinks south. It clears from the far north and northwest, but it edges into Northern Ireland, parts of Northern England as well. It stays cloudy across southern areas, but through this slice of central UK, clearer spells and perhaps a few pockets of fog first thing. A chilly start here as well. And once the fog clears, plenty of sunshine emerging across parts of North and East Wales, the Midlands, Eastern England. Also turning brighter to the north of the Central Belt, some decent sunshine here and less windy compared to Tuesday. Otherwise, a lot of cloud cover, some light outbreaks of rain and drizzle, more persistent damp weather for parts of Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland and Northwest England. And this area of cloud and outbreaks of rain starts to move north once again on Wednesday evening pushing into the rest of Scotland eventually overnight. Meanwhile, it stays mostly cloudy across Wales, southern and southwest England. But for the Midlands, eastern England, southern Scotland, clear spells, which will lead to, in some places, frost and even fog to begin things on Thursday. Once any fog clears, though, the best of any sunny spells will be across eastern Scotland, southern Scotland, northern and eastern England. Generally cloudy skies elsewhere. The rain in the far north of Scotland eases through the day so that by the afternoon actually many places are dry, but it will turn a bit colder. High pressure is extending across the whole of the UK on Thursday and Friday. It will bring a lot of cloud, but it will also turn things colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. 
This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Darren Grimes is tonight's outsider. Now, you'll all know Darren has been a star of this show since day one. So there was some exciting news today. It's been announced that Darren will be hosting his own show on GB News on Saturdays and Sundays in the new year called Real Britain. So, Darren, congratulations. What is Real Britain to you? And, and tell me about this new show. Thank you very much. Listen, I think Real Britain to me, if you compare GB News to Brexit, I think you can easily make a good a good comparison because if you think about Brexit, Dan, we were told that it was it was never going to happen, right? That you could never ever compete against every organization with an acronym, every establishment political figure and well-moneyed elites and actually win. But we did win. And similarly, I think GB News is told that it can't compete against established figures like the BBC and Sky, those behemoths, the BBC, of course, having the ultimate anti-competitive privileges and the money we're all ha forced to hand over to it of, of, as well, of course. But I think it actually can and it is and it will in the same way that some established commentators sneer and roll their eyes at the announcement actually made today, Dan. I think actually this working class, this this gay Brexit supporter that, you know, all of those identity checklists that say that I shouldn't have different politics to those that I do actually hold, Dan. I actually think they stand me up in good stead to actually succeed at GB News. And it's a perfect vehicle because I think actually it's given people hope, this channel. It's given people an, an avenue to have the conversation that you've just had with Nigel Farage, because I tell you what, Dan, they're certainly not having it on Sky News or the BBC. Indeed, you're very right. Um, when does it start, Darren? Next year? So it, it, yeah, next year, early January, it'll start and then we'll get straight into it. And look, I think I've been listening to Jordan Peterson before I came on air and he wrote for the Daily Telegraph today on how how much he loves Britain. And he was speaking about the world's most precious gifts that we've given the world. The freedom of speech, imagination and thought. And he talks about all of these freedoms that were taken for granted. Similarly, you've been talking about that tonight, Dan. And I actually want to pop, make them front and centre of that show, right? We're going to have a, a section called You Can't Say That. You know, we're, increasingly we're told that's offensive. And this is a culture that places ideology ahead of even biology, for example. So well, I want to actually get okay. through. Well, I can't wait. I think it's going to be brilliant. Looking forward to it, Darren. Uh, give me your real Britain analysis on the breaking news tonight. Uh, this big Tory rebellion in the House of Commons. Uh, Darren, what does real Britain think about this? Look, I think Real Britain is actually quite scared, to be honest with you. And I, wouldn't you be, Dan, if you were to exclusively get your news from other outlets? You know, this idea that this mild variant, what we're increasingly seeing is a mild variant, that, that we need to do all of this window dressing and this rehearsal, I'm afraid, 
for putting us back into lockdown. Nicola Sturgeon has placed Scotland in greater restrictions. It's a de facto lockdown. They're getting closer to it, Dan, as you well know. They're limiting mix in households to three households. That's what they want you to do. And I think we'll end up following suit. I really, really do. But I am heartened, what I will say, to give people optimism. I am really heartened by the size of the rebellion in the Conservative Party, right? Tonight, they have shown that they're willing to actually stand up to Boris Johnson, stand up to a man who they see as their winner, because it wasn't enough tonight, I think, to actually defeat the government. You have to actually terrify them. And, you know, despite that defeat not coming, the government, I have absolutely no doubt will be terrified by this threat to number 10 when it comes to further restrictions. I think they will realise now you cannot, you haven't got a hope in hell's chance of passing draconian restrictions that go further than what this plan B actually says, which I think is a terrible overreaction, Dan. I really, really do. Darren Grimes, I hope you're right. We cannot have plan C. We shouldn't even have plan B. And congratulations again on the new show, Real Britain, which starts on Saturdays and Sundays at 2 p.m., right, Darren? 2 p.m. Yeah, that's right. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Must watch. Darren Grimes, thank you so much. It's coming up to 10 p.m. breaking tonight. A heroic quarter of Tory MPs rebelled against draconian plans for vaccine passports. But all of the new COVID restrictions, including mandatory jabs for NHS workers, were passed thanks to Labour's feckless opposition. We'll take a look at how the newspaper front pages are reacting to the biggest Tory rebellion of the PM's premiership throughout the hour. And faced with the prospect of 500,000 or possibly 1 million COVID infections a day, is it time for us to finally accept that we need to shield the vulnerable and let the rest of us live our lives? Stanford medical professor Jay Bhattacharya, the co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, which proposes just that, joins me in uncancelled before the end of the show. Will vaccine travel passports for 12 to 15 year olds solve Christmas holidays or are they simply a weapon to get kids jabbed? And after a heartless postman was sacked for ignoring a pensioner who had slipped in the snow, should you be punished for failing to be a good Samaritan? I'll put those questions to my panel in the media buzz. Plus, how did Netflix go from a mail order service with just 30 employees to a game changing streamer with over 200 million users? Its co founder, Mark Randolph, reveals the secrets of the company's meteoric rise at 1020. And of course, we'll crown another greatest Britain and Union Jackass too. But first, the news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you. Good evening. MPs have voted for tougher COVID restrictions in England. Plan B measures, including COVID passes for entry into nightclubs and other large venues, are being introduced. Face coverings will also be extended to include indoor venues such as museums and galleries. And MPs also approved mandatory vaccinations for NHS and social care staff by April next year. And in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon has announced she's not cancelling Christmas. Instead, she says it's time now to ask people to limit their socialising to a maximum of three households during the holiday period. Turning to Christmas Day specifically, or Christmas Eve or Boxing Day, or whenever you have your main family celebration, we are not asking you to cancel or change your plans, and we are not proposing limits on the size of household gatherings. Keeping your celebrations as small as your family circumstances allow is sensible too. Make sure everyone in your gathering is vaccinated and has done a test in advance. Keep rooms ventilated and follow strict hygiene rules. The government's appealing for tens of thousands of volunteers to help with the booster jab programme. It announced a target of nearly one million jabs a day to get all eligible adults vaccinated by the end of December. But the former NHS Trust chairman Roy Lilly told GB News that's unrealistic. It's to suddenly on Sunday night say, oh, listen, and by the way, on Monday we're going to do a million vaccinations. Oh, no, we're not. Uh, you know, we've got to recruit the... Uh, the volunteers with the estates people have got to sort out the locations, there's security, there's clinical waste, there's logistics. I mean, this is a big operation, and I'm not saying the NHS isn't up for it. It is. 
But if you simply do the numbers, the carryover of the unvaccinated into the next day, it's just statistically impossible to do by the end of the month. Well, in other news today, the Prime Minister has described the murder of 16-month-old star Hobson in West Yorkshire as shocking and heartbreaking. Boris Johnson also says lessons need to be learned and children must be protected from these barbaric crimes. Savannah Brockhill, pictured on the right, was convicted of murdering the toddler, her partner and star's mother, Frankie Smith, seen on the left, has been found guilty of causing or allowing the death of a child. Star's great-grandfather says he saw worrying signs of abuse in the family. Now, Malta has become the first European country to approve the personal use of cannabis. The law, approved by 36 votes to 27, allows adults to possess up to seven grams of marijuana and grow up to four plants at home. The country's equality minister says the move will ensure there's a safe and regularised way of obtaining the substance. You're up to date. Now back to Dan Wooden. Tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. Let's kick off with the very first look at the front page is hot off the press and very disturbing front page here from the I newspaper reporting that the government is studying the possibility of further restrictions with household bubbles and social distancing under con consideration of rates soar. This comes after Chris Whitty told the Prime Minister that he believed a significant increase in hospitalisations was on the way. They say ministers have been spooked by the rapid spread, but I think what ministers should be spooked by is the vote tonight, which will make these further restrictions being introduced, surely impossible, and I hope so too. The Metro leads two with the 99-strong Tory rebellion and describes it as a Xmas stuffing. The paper reports that the revolt wasn't quelled despite Boris holding last-minute meetings with backbenchers and a last gasp ring around to secure support. This rebellion dwarfs the 55 Tories who defied the whip over new rules last Christmas. And here we are, back again, folks. Across the border, the Herald has accused ministers of imposing lockdown by stealth, and that's exactly what they're doing in Scotland. It's after Nicola Sturgeon, who just seems to love controlling her people and telling them exactly what to do. I think she's addicted to the power. And she urged Scots to minimise socialising to a maximum of three households at once over the festive season. She insisted she wasn't asking people to cancel their Christmas. But by the way, that's exactly what she was doing. Do you know what all of you brilliant Scottish people should do? Ignore her. Just absolutely point blank ignore her. Because Nicola Sturgeon has absolutely no right to tell you who you socialise with. My superstar panel back with me now, the former editor of The Daily Star. And she's ready to celebrate Christmas, no matter what Nicola Sturgeon tells her, <laughs> Dawn Neeson. The Conservative commentator, Calvin Robinson. Is that a Christmas jumper, Calvin? It is. It's a subtle one. Very subtle neat. One. Very you can wear it other times. It's very tasteful. It's very I'm tasteful. running out of them now, though. And I love it with a bow tie, actually. Thank you. And the journalist and author, Rebecca Reed. Now, if you fancy a Christmas trip, we're getting a bit of winter sun in the new year, I'm assuming we're going to be allowed to do that. Uh, and if you're taking your kids, they too may now have to submit to vaccine passports. It was missed in all of this tidal wave of news over the past 24 hours that Health Secretary Sajid Javid announced he was expanding the scheme, which originally was only available for those aged 15 or 16 or over, but he's expanded it to 12 to 15-year-olds. Today, I can confirm that the NHS COVID pass is being rolled out to 12 and 15-year-olds for international travel allowing even more people to be able to prove their vaccine status for travel where it is needed. The move was in a response to a number of countries across the world requiring proof of COVID vaccination from youngsters to access certain venues or paths through borders. From today, New York, a popular destination for travellers during the festive season, will ask children as young as five to provide proof they have received at least one dose in order to access venues such as theatres, restaurants and museums. Italy, Austria, France and Canada are among the other countries with similar requirements. 
Spain, meanwhile, requires over 12s to show proof they are double vaccinated, while Malta and Germany are also only letting in fully vaccinated teens. While some travellers may welcome the change for saving their holidays, other notable figures have expressed outrage, including the brilliant Star Daily Telegraph columnist Alison Pearson. She tweeted, this is repugnant. Coercion for vaccination is a breach of human rights. Sajid Javid just said goodbye to being Tory leader. And Bernie Spofforth, who has been fighting Twitter's attempts to censor her views on COVID, pointed out many parents who have compiled themselves, sorry, many parents who have complied themselves are cautious about their children. Unless they give in, their children can no longer go on holiday. This is not freedom, it's tyranny. So, Calvin Robinson, has the government saved Christmas holidays or just ramped up the pressure for young people to get jabbed? So they've ramped up the pressure, and this is tyranny, this is coercion. I love Alison Pearson and Bernie, by the way, both fantastic at fighting the good fight on this, but children, I mean, I don't want to use hyperbole, but this is wicked, this is evil. Children don't need the vaccine. Uh, they're more at risk from the vaccine than from the virus itself. Com countries like Japan are now putting warning labels on the vaccine, saying, you know, young people are at risk of myocarditis. It's actually... In, it is abhorrent that we're saying that young people should have the vaccine in order to travel. I, I, I'm lost for words for once. Rebecca Reid, do you think this is evil? I mean, this isn't our call. This is, this is the decision of... So Canada have said, if you would like to come in and you are a child, you must be vaccinated if you are over the age of whatever it is. All that Sajid Javid... Not sure why I'm defending him, I'm not a fan, but all that he's done is made it that if you were already going to Canada, it's easier to prove if you have already been vaccinated. And I think individual countries have the right to decide what their individual rules are for who has who, for who, who can come in and who can't. I think we generally agree with that on other things. I don't personally think children need to be vaccinated. I wouldn't personally vaccinate my children yet until I understood what the long-term repercussions for Which that would be. Which means you couldn't take them on holiday. I mean, if I can't take my kids to Canada, I'll probably not die. But like, if I can't that, go to it's Spain, bigger. I'll probably be OK. Because the international community should decide this as a whole, because the Human Rights Act is something that is bigger than just our but country. But when is that? I mean, so the rarely. The Nuremberg Code, for example, is something that's bigger than our country. All of these things are bigger than just us saying, I OK, think if you want to come in. I find international consensus is incredibly hard to achieve. You know, Canada has a very different attitude towards things. Spain, ha we, we're, we have national characteristics. We have national identities, and I think getting everybody to agree on something is very, very difficult. They've already agreed that medical coercion is wrong and illegal. This is a Dawn. growing list as well. I mean, mm. five-year-olds going to New yeah. York, five. No. Well, uh, well I think, if, if, if you're the parent heart. of a young New York child, you can't take them to the theatre if they don't have the they vaccination have show, at five they, they years old. They have to show the vaccine papers. And what, wrong, what about it? school? If they're not vaccinated, are they Well, actually, I've spoken to Megan Kelly. To well, I've spoken to Megan Kelly quite a lot about this. You can go to school, but you're excluded uh, from a lot of activities what? like sport and amateur theatre and all of that sort of what thing. What society are we creating for children? The division that we we know children bully each other in any case. I mean, the division and the hatred this is going to create. In little kids already. I think it's difficult, though, because if we were talking about the measles vaccine, I would be saying, absolutely, I would never have an unvaccinated child who wasn't, who hadn't had the measles vaccine in my home around my children. So it's only because I understand the fear that I'm against, that I'm on, uh, that I'm agreeing with you but guys. we've never been like that with any other vaccine. And, and where is the well, science? What bit. science are we following on this? Where is the proof that children of that age are in danger, as Calvin said, Ooh. from getting very ill, in danger of being super spreaders. None of well, these things. Well, they're the guinea pigs. They're the guinea pigs. Can I on, on vaccines as well, Rebecca? Because would you question... when you? I know you're, you, you haven't, your kid isn't at that age yet, but if you had a child that it was at the age of having a birthday party, would you ask the parents of those children that you're inviting which vaccines they've had yeah. before you invited them to your home? Well, or, I think or would you, or would you, or would you that... consider that your child has had the vaccine, therefore is protected from these things? I think at that stage, if you're having a fifth birthday party, you generally know your, your group well enough to have sensed what people's vaccine things are and generally amongst yeah, your friends. Kind of you how how horrible. I would be very surprised. I, how horrible it's no one's business. I keep reading these articles in the left-wing well, press. One in The Guardian mm. uh, talking about 
the misery of Christmas because how do you cope if you have someone unvaccinated and around the table? I am never ever going to oh. question people on their medical history. No way. To do but anything I think, social with them. But I, I think, think it's I think appalling. On a private level, if you're having a party at your house, I've got lots of friends who've said, um, I'm having a party and only vaccinated people are welcome to come. Oh, now, that's their choice. Sure. That is their choice. It is their house. It is their choice. It is their guest list. That is up to them. I Would um, I do that? Personally, no. I but that is that their house. wouldn't be my so friends. I'm sorry. But that's horrific. the great thing about a free society. I can say anybody who thinks purple is a good colour can't come to my house. We do think some the worst forms colour. of discrimination are, are not OK, though, don't we? Well, I mean, so I think we all agree on that, don't we? Like, presumably... Well, but but all... how, how is it Where's different? the line is the different thing. Because, mm. because you are discriminating. I mean, look, the one thing I would say 100%, my house is open to my friends and family and colleagues and loved ones, regardless of, of course, their vaccination absolutely. status. And I think the people who put these, uh, these, these terrible restrictions on their own lives... Yeah are actually pretty disgusting. But it's their choice. That is just their choice. It, it, you, know, you know what? It, it's, it's but would you be saying that, Becca? Sorry to interrupt, Dawn, but would you be saying that, Becca, if it was, don't come round to my house if you voted for Brexit? I mean, I definitely have friends. Again, I don't feel that way, but I definitely have friends who say, I don't want to socialise you if you, if, if you believe that about Brexit. But I this have is friends, the tyranny of the left, isn't I have it, friends, But I also it's have friends who say, if, you, if you're going to do cocaine at my house, please don't come over. Like, the, the, different people have different lines, and yeah, you're allowed to find what lines. breaking run. an actual law of the land. <laughs> yeah, the other isn't. Different. I mean, it's yeah. like... But, I mean, it, it's just... I just I can't understand the mentality no. of discriminating no. and, and, on that and level. And it feels like we want, or certain segments of society want to create division. They did it with Brexit, and now they're doing it with your vaccination status, and I think it's wrong. Uh, message to Adele, we've found someone like you, oh and it's God. the breakfast TV legend, my friend Lorraine Kelly. The superstar broadcaster underwent a stunning transformation to recreate Adele's look. So this is Adele from her Easy On Me video. And the transformation was courtesy of Heat magazine. So take a look at Lou. This is a proper homage to Adele. I'm paying tribute to the goddess yeah. that is Adele. I hope she doesn't mind, you know, women of my age. Oh. Two icons in one. Rebecca Reed, Calvin Robinson, <laughs> Dawn Newsom, do stand by. What, you're not convinced? No! no we're not terrible. Like that, are we? Terrible. It's terrible. Like... That was Lorraine in a bad wig. Bless her. Dan, you look more like a girl. Yeah. Sorry. Well, Without I the thought, wig. <laughs> I thought it was uncanny. <laughs> Coming up, should you be punished for failing to be a good Samaritan? The panel will take me on as we look at the story of a postman sacked for refusing to help a fallen grandma. That's in the media buzz at 10.30. We'll also bring you much more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages too, reacting to the big vote in Parliament today. But up next, with 500,000 or even 1 million cases of uh, COVID potentially on the horizon, are vaccine passports the only way to deal with Omicron? Or is it time to adopt a shielding strategy? Professor Jay Bhattacharya, who one of the men behind the Great Barrington Declaration joins me in Uncancelled next. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi there, welcome to the latest forecast. There'll be a lot of cloud during the next 24 hours, shrouding the hills of the western UK and keeping things mild. There'll be some rain as well, but that will tend to ease later as this area of high pressure moves in for the rest of the week and begins to properly settle things down widely. Before that happens, these weather fronts and these tightly packed isobars across northern parts of the UK bring wind and rain for Tuesday evening. Some heavier rain at times for the northwest highlands, but through the night, the area of cloud and rain across Scotland sinks south. It clears from the far north and northwest, but it edges into Northern Ireland, parts of Northern England as well. It stays cloudy across southern areas, but through this slice of central UK, clearer spells and perhaps a few pockets of Fog first thing. A chilly start here as well. Once the 
fog clears, plenty of sunshine emerging across parts of north and east Wales, the Midlands, eastern England. Also turning brighter to the north of the central belt, some decent sunshine here and less windy compared to Tuesday. Otherwise, a lot of cloud cover, some light outbreaks of rain and drizzle, more persistent damp weather for parts of Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland and Northwest England. And this area of cloud and outbreaks of rain starts to move north once again on Wednesday evening, pushing into the rest of Scotland eventually overnight. Meanwhile, it stays mostly cloudy across Wales, southern and southwest England. But for the Midlands, eastern England, southern Scotland, clear spells, which will lead to, in some places, frost and even fog to begin things on Thursday. Once any fog clears, though, the best of any sunny spells will be across eastern Scotland, southern Scotland, northern and eastern England. Generally cloudy skies elsewhere. The rain in the far north of Scotland eases through the day so that by the afternoon actually many places are dry, but it will turn a bit colder. High pressure is extending across the whole of the UK on Thursday and Friday. It will bring a lot of cloud, but it will also turn things colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. It's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where the world's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. And Jay Bhattacharya is, of course, one of, I think, the most important voices when it comes to the COVID battle. He is the co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, which has almost 900,000 signatories, including myself. 
And Jay, I really wanted to talk to you tonight because it feels like we're at a tipping point here in the UK. There are reports that there are going to be 500,000, potentially even 1 million cases of this new Omicron variant of COVID-19. But if you look at South Africa and what's going on there, actually Omicron is far milder than Delta and seems to cause far less hospital uh, hospitalizations, far fewer deaths. So surely the only way we can operate as a society is if we move towards your model, which is sheltered protection of the really vulnerable and allow the rest of us to get on with our lives. I mean, I think uh, one thing that we've learned in the years since uh, I wrote the Great Barrington Declaration is that we do not have a technology to stop the spread of this disease. The, the, unfortunately, the lockdowns don't stop the spread of the disease, and even the vaccines do not stop the spread of this disease. We simply do not have a technology that does that. Once you come to terms with that, then you're led to the question, how do we preserve life as best we can? And that leads you to focus protection. That is really the only path we have. Uh, but now, actually, there's lots of good news to tell. We, we can either go down this old, this old path, which hasn't worked, vaccine passports, mandates, uh, forced masking, forced uh, sort of isolation, or we can emphasize the good news. We have vaccines that are fantastic to protect people who are vulnerable against severe disease. That's still true. Uh, the, this Omicron appears to be milder, which is good news. But uh, at the same time, we also have better treatments, for instance, monoclonal antibodies and other treatments. And we have uh, these, these uh, rapid antigen tests. So before you go visit grandma, you can check to see if you're positive. We have all this good news that we could use to say, let's get back to normal life while protecting the vulnerable. Or we can go down the old path that didn't work before that caused so much collateral harm. I think those, that's the choice we face right now. Indeed. And as you point out, we could potentially get to herd immunity quite quickly, couldn't we? I mean, I think uh, it, it, it's really important to, for folks to understand what herd immunity means. Herd immunity doesn't mean the disease is gone. It actually circulates forever. I mean, this is not a disease that we have a capacity to eradicate. Uh, but what it does mean is that those who have been infected and recovered they actually have quite good protection against reinfection for a long time, and, and reinfections tend to be much milder than the first time. So what's the lesson from this? If you, the, it's the first, everyone is going to meet this virus at some point in their life. That's, it's, not, it's just not possible to, to, to avoid it unless you put yourself in a cave forever. If that's true, that means that it's best that you meet it with a mild variant or with a, and with a vaccine on board the first time you meet it. Uh, after that, it's likely that you'll be protected by this, uh, by this recovery from COVID. And I think that is really the, the, the key thing. Let's deprogram people of the fear. There's no reason to fear. We have the tools to address the disease so that when you meet it, it will not be a devastating outcome. Um, and we should stop the restrictions that have been harming society for so long. Jay, what's so interesting is that our government seems to be focusing on fear. I'm not sure if you saw it from over there, but Boris Johnson uh, hosted a prime time address to the nation on Sunday night and spoke of a tidal wave of Omicron uh, coming. And he actually said we should ignore the science. We should put to one side the scientists, the science that, that says Omicron might not be as severe. But you say, actually, the government should focus on telling people the good news and certainly not ostracizing folk who've chosen not to be vaccinated. I mean, you can look and see what happened on the continent when they instituted vaccine passports and green passes and the like. It hasn't stopped the disease from spreading there, and it will not stop the disease from spreading in the UK. All it will do is serve to create an outclass of people who, many of whom actually worked during the pandemic, got sick and then recovered uh, because they're, they were deemed essential and, and say, look, you're no longer the heroes of the pandemic, you're the outclass. And it will serve no purpose in terms of protecting anybody. The, what we can do is not, is to, what we should do is stop spreading the fear, stop ostracizing people, uh, instead just provide tools, the, the, the tools that we know work. We know the vaccine 
protects against severe disease. Let's let's act on that. We know we have uh, better treatments than we once had before. We know we can use these rapid antigen tests. Like the NHS has done a great job giving those for inexpensive for for people who want them. Um, in the U.S., they've been much more expensive. I think that all of that is all so good, and and, and by emphasizing that, you empower people to deal with the, the risk instead of putting them into, into panic and fear that is not productive. And all it does is is further the isolation, the, the psychological stress, the harms, the collateral damage that come during this pandemic. And Jay, I don't know if you've caught up with the big breaking news out of uh, our parliament tonight, but Boris Johnson has suffered a huge rebellion, the biggest rebellion of his premiership over the introduction of vaccine passports with nearly 100 of his own MPs voting against their introduction. One of the reasons for that, Jay, is obviously vaccine passports have already been introduced in lots of countries around the world, including, by the way, in Scotland and Wales here in the UK. And there's no evidence that they do anything to stop the spread of COVID. Have you seen any evidence to say that vaccine passports are the answer to this situation? Not that I would ever be elected to any office, but I tell you, I would vote with the rebels in this case. <laughs> um, the uh, the uh, vaccine passports, I don't actually believe were ever designed to stop the disease from spreading. And the reason is simple. The vaccine does not stop infection. Many people have had the vaccine and then subsequently got COVID. I, for instance, I'm one of them. I was vaccinated in April and then got COVID in August. I think that's a very common outcome. Uh, so the vaccine passports, it's not, it's not particularly safe, safer to mingle with vaccinated versus unvaccinated. It's not, not, there's not appreciable difference in the risk between mingling with one group or another. What the vaccine passports I think were designed to do were to, were to increase uptake of vaccines. But that kind of coercion, I believe, backfires. It creates distrust among a class of a set of people who say, well, why are being, am I being forced to do something I don't want to do? The right way to encourage people to get vaccinated is to deal with them as adults. Tell them, here's the benefits, here are the risks. Uh, on, in your situation, if you're, you're older, you haven't had COVID before, it really is a good thing to get vaccinated. It'll protect you against severe disease if you get it. I mean, telling people that, treating them like adults is the better way, rather than this sort of coercive policy that we follow. Well, I completely agree. I completely agree, Jay. And, you know, if only folk had listened to you long ago, maybe we still wouldn't be in this situation uh, right now. It's not too late. We can still <laughs> we can still choose, as we said. There's a path. We can choose the path, a rational path where we say let we have the tools to protect each other from the virus, to pr protect the protect the uh, against severe disease from the virus. I mean, you may you will get infected. It's likely, but uh, you you're not. That's not going to harm you so much. Versus this other path where people will still be infected, but we'll have lockdowns psychological harm, all the other collateral harms that have come with the path, the, the, the second path. It will not protect you against the disease, uh, ultimately. And so, I mean, I think we still have that choice and we can still follow that, that, that more rational, sane path, this is the first path. Jay Bhattacharya, co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, someone who talks a lot of sense throughout this COVID crisis. And thank you so much for joining me again tonight. Thank you, Dan. Coming up. Find out which superstar panellist was riled by Matt Hancock's turtleneck outfit on Saturday night as I ground my greatest Britain and union jackass. But next, should failing to be a good Samaritan really be a sackable offence? We'll be looking at the shocking case of the postie who ignored a pensioner in peril in the media buzz next. Plus, we'll have more of the newspapers and see how they've covered today's monumental Plan B vote. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. 
Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Let's return to tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. And more front pages have just been delivered. I don't think they're going to make happy reading in number 10 Downing Street. Ministers flying blind on the size of the Omicron wave leads the independent. A lack of COVID tests has left the government unsure over the full scale of the wave as it tries to calculate where the further restrictions will be needed. Also on the front page is the news that a woman has been found guilty of murdering her girlfriend's 16th-month-old daughter, Star Hobson, uh, after weeks of abuse. This was just a heartbreaking story today. The Guardian, of course, gleeful about tonight's vote, uh, but not because they actually disagree with COVID passports, simply because they want to bring down Boris Johnson. They also lead on the potential that one million Omicron cases a day, which I just discussed with Professor Jay Bhattacharya, could be coming. The Daily Telegraph's headline, remember, this is the one that will hurt the Prime Minister the most. It's his newspaper. It's the one he reads first in the morning. And the headline, Tory COVID rebels deal hammer blow to Johnson's authority. Elsewhere on the front page, government COVID advisor Professor Robert Dingwall from Nottingham Trent University believes Britain's Omicron wave may be no worse than a flu pandemic. And look there, Alison Pearson at the top of uh, the newspaper saying, rebels, question mark, they're true conservatives. And I think she's right. The Times also leads on the huge rebellion that they say stunned the PM plus the gloomy prediction that more than one million people could be in COVID isolation on Christmas Day. As our politicians lose their heads over COVID, the sun says keep calm like mom. The Queen is reportedly uh, putting aside Omicron fears that are engulfing the government and still plans on holding her family Christmas party. This, of course, comes after the PM faced his biggest rebellion as nearly 100 Tory MPs opposed COVID passports for major events with pubs and businesses saying they have been plunged into lockdown by stealth. And this is really interesting, uh, this Sun story, actually, because throughout this pandemic, the Queen has, I think, been the moral authority and has been the person that we probably look to most. There have been times when the Queen took off her mask, for example, and I think it sends a really good message, actually, that she still plans to hold her Christmas party. Well done, Mum. Yet again, not giving in to the hysteria. The Daily Mail doesn't go with a Plan B vote, actually, but leads on the awful cases of 16-month-old Star Hobson, who was killed in the care of her mother and her violent girlfriend, and also Ella Rose Clover, who was 22 months old when she was murdered by her godmother's boyfriend in January 2018. The paper promises to lay bare shocking failings by social workers and doctors and also touches on the tragic murder of Arthur Labinjo Hughes, which of course dominated the news agenda earlier this month. 
a week after the Daily Star launched its hunt for Dominic Raab's missing organ, they say the top Tory deputy prime minister, you know, is still brainless. This is after the deputy PM said 250 people are in hospital with Omicron before revealing hours later that the real figure is a mere 10. My superstar panel back with me now. Let me come first to the former editor of the Daily Star. You're their current columnist, Dawn Neeson. Uh, why does the star hate Dominic Raab so much? <laughs> um, because he's an idiot, basically. Does that help you narrow it down slightly? <laughs> um, I mean, and, and I take issue with the fact that he's the deputy PM as well, because I don't think he is anymore. I think he's Starmer's the deputy PM these days. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like Boris. Yeah, that's seem fine. Let's to just do it. A COVID coalition government. Yeah. Uh, she's joined on the sofa tonight by the Conservative commentator Calvin Robinson, and also the journalist and author Rebecca Reed. Now. A scumbag postman has rightly been sacked, in my view, by the Royal Mail for leaving a frail pensioner lying in the snow after she slipped by her front door in February this year. Heartless Thomas McCafferty was caught on camera callously ignoring grandmother of two, Patricia Stewart, as she lay injured in the snow in Falkirk, Scotland. Ms Stewart had slipped in icy conditions caused by the coldest winter for 26 years. But, and I just can't believe this, after spotting her lying there, McCafferty simply said, I can't help you, pal. He then told the 72-year-old who suffers from osteoporosis and injured her head in the fall that he was too knackered to help before leaving her hurt and calling for help in the snow. Now, Miss Stewart was left with an egg-sized lump on her head, but thankfully... Thankfully, was discovered by another delivery driver 20 minutes later. Royal Mail have now confirmed McCafferty has been sacked. And a spokesman for the company said, Royal Mail expects the highest standards of behaviour. We regularly remind our postmen and postwomen of the important role they play in their local communities. We can confirm that the individual concerned has left the business. But Rebecca Reid, this is got a lot of people talking today. Do you think you should be punished professionally for failing to be a good Samaritan? No. He posted the letters, which is what he was paid to do. That is his job. And then he went on with the rest of his day. I think people misunderstand how much pressure is on you, particularly during lockdowns, where the postal service was massively overwrought. And if you didn't do all of your deliveries, you got penalised. And I'm sorry, I'm, I think it's sad that he didn't have time. I think he's probably not my favourite person. But that's not his job. His job is delivering letters, and he delivered the letters. But, Calvin, what if this woman had died? I'm sorry, I actually... Right. If, if that was my mum, mm. I absolutely believe that is part of a postman's job, to, to, to make sure that she does not lie there dying in the snow. So I think it's immoral of him. It's wrong of him to leave her. I don't think it's his job. I think we all, it's all of our duty, actually, as a community, to make mm. sure that mm. the elderly are looked after. And if anyone else was in the area, they should have... Uh, they would have had a responsibility just as he did for being there. But it's not up to his employer to sack him mm. for not doing it. That's inappropriate. That's an over overreach. But, Dawn Neeson, do you not think that actually he has put Royal Mail into disrepute? Oh, we're all disagreeing with you tonight. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dan, I'm sorry. I, I think it has... I don't believe you can watch that video and no, no, think no, no, that no, bloke no, should keep no, no, his no, I, I agree with Calvin. It was wrong. It was heartless. And as Rebecca said, he's not going to be your favourite person in the world. And I, I, I think, you know, I, I would not have done it. Of course I would have helped. However, he was doing his job. He wasn't not doing his job. So on what grounds was he actually sacked? They haven't explained on what grounds he was sacked. Because he was fulfilling his duty for which he is paid to do. Mm. And now, also, what he did was morally wrong, as Calvin yeah. said, but he was doing his job, so I don't think it's the company... Well, well, but, 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 Rebecca, office. Rebecca, can I just let you know what Royal Mail's saying and mm -hmm. you can respond? Because they say that they expect the highest standards of behaviour from their posties. And, I'm sorry, leaving an elderly, or at least a slightly older, I know you dispute she's not that she's elderly, elderly, she's 72, and we should not be using that kind of language around people well, who are not that old. A frail pensioner is how she's being That's, described. That was a journalistic decision okay, to call that, her that frail pensioner. That is how pensioner. she's being described. She's a 72-year-old woman. Yeah. To be honest, I wouldn't care what age this yeah, person is. but her age is actually. irrelevant, actually, yeah. 
she is lying in the snow. Yes, it wasn't very nice, but when you join Royal Mail, are you given social work training on how to check on people? Are you paid to be a member of the community that goes around making sure everyone's okay? No, but they're not, no. ex but they're not expecting the postie to go in and run the household. I mean... Simply pick her up out of the snow <laughs> and make snow. sure that she's if alive. If your social care plan is not I should be responsible for my own family members or neighbours to <sighs> check on neighbours, it's the postie should make sure that everybody's all right, then you are failing at your social care. OK, I'm astonished. <laughs> Outvoted. <laughs> when Sorry. will we start putting our children's future before COVID again? Schools, and this is so predictable but so wrong, have again started remote lessons for the final week of term and head teachers are updating plans for remote learning in January in case schools are told not to reopen following the Christmas break. Unions. Those terrible education unions who actually seem to want to do everything possible to stop teachers teaching have warned that Omicron is causing chaos. So schools around the country have told parents to keep kids at home amid the rising panic caused by the government. Calvin Robertson, I think it's absolutely terrible that Sajid Javid would not guarantee yesterday that schools will stay open. Yeah, absolutely. And we always have to remember that these teaching unions are political and it's, they are not looking after the best interests of the pupils, not their education, not their well-being, either physical, mental or spiritual. They're not looking after that. That's not their remit. So the gov government needs to take into consideration what the unions say, but not make the decision based on what the unions say. And that's what we saw mm. last year when they closed schools before they closed down the rest of the economy, actually. And we've seen a rise in domestic abuse. We've seen a rise in mental, uh, in ill mental health and, and all of these things are a result of children not being in school. It's not good well, for them. Well, look at Arthur, Dawn. I was just going to mention Arthur's name, actually. I mean, we know, and it was part of the, the, the findings in the trial, that Arthur was partly a victim of lockdown. He may have survived the hideous treatment he received had people not been in lockdown. His own uncle was reported for breaking lockdown rules for trying to save that little boy's life. Now, we know there are 10,000 children missing, Dan, They've just gone AWOL, mm. who were in social care, who were being monitored at school. To close down schools again, it's not just messing with kids' education. It's messing with vulnerable children's lives. And we, we, I don't want another Arthur. I mean, it's just heartbreaking what happened to that little boy. And how many more other children are out there, at, as we speak now, going through that sort of torture? To, to close down schools again is condemning more children to that. But, Rebecca, you say schools shouldn't be forced to stay open before Christmas. I think it's very difficult. I do take on board everything Dawn has said, and I do think the fact that there's been a rise in, ch in child abuse and child deaths is not unrelated to lockdowns. But I also have sympathy that if I were a teacher and I was looking at either school ending four, term ending four days early and then me being able to have enough time to isolate before going home and still seeing my family or school staying open for four days and me missing Christmas with my family, I probably would be thinking the latter. No, as and a, I would, but that, I, I, because as, I think... As a, as, as, you were a as, a, as a former teacher, look, teaching is a vocation and that's a very selfish mindset to think, I, if I, I get four... What's four days of a child's uh, learning? Four days could be a month or two months' worth of learning But the end of term because, isn't a very learning you No, it is. You learn, you learn... You learn. No, it's, it's not at all. You learn right up to the end of term in a good school. You learn right up to the last... 30 seconds, you don't have videos and, and games and but stuff I in think a good the, school. I think the games and, and videos are important, so we've, it's we've, fun, it's No, it's, no, it's not, it's not. You, fun is at home, school is for learning, school is for passing on, on knowledge. But we've talked about the vulnerable kids that missed mm. out, but every kid has missed out. Kids mm. of this of generation now I mean, are like well, two, yeah. at least two years behind the previous generation. Yeah. I think it, it depends on the parents, doesn't it? If you have wealthy parents who can afford to spend lots of time with you and have and are educated and there are books in your house, la, 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 you're not going to be behind to the same extent as, as if your parents are functionally illiterate. But, but so many, are. Many, That's not to say that it isn't So important. many children aren't in that boat and, and they, their mm. education will never catch up and what we do to them now will affect them for the mm. rest yeah. of but their lives. But we actually Everybody... saw official documentation last week, Calvin, saying doesn't matter whether you're a privileged student, doesn't matter if you're an underprivileged student. Yeah. Every single student over the past year has, been has missed yeah. out yeah. and been affected by the schools closing. Right. And I just worry, Calvin, we're not learning the lessons we're in not. any area. And the teaching unions have almost become addicted to this idea that teachers can be predicted, yeah. uh, can be protected from, from getting a cold. They can't be, so they also can't be protected well, from getting very mild Omicron. It's not, it's not a cold. 
No, but it's becoming increasingly it's like that. It's becoming uh, endemic. I, th I think it's fair to say that teaching is a vocation. I'm not a teacher. I'm not an unselfish person. I think that's a fair argument. But it, it, come on, let's be realistic. It's still scary to get COVID, and it's still understandable Why? to not want COVID. I don't but some think people, people do get very ill. I, some people I, don't. But some people I, do. With Omicron, people don't tend to get very ill. But the problem is, I want to really hammer home that even one lesson missed is more than just half an hour or more than just yeah. an hour of learning missed. Exactly. Because of the way we and, do progress and, in this and country. And the fear that I have is so much has become present precedent setting over the past 20 months. We're not learning from our mistakes. No, but I, I mean, here we are in a situation where we're literally telling people, oh, no, you can't go and see no. the GP. But if and we've learned time and again over the past 12 months that that is going to cause a catastrophe when it comes to cancer. So we're not learning lessons when Our it children comes to the NHS. Better. But, if yeah, but we have to learn lessons when it comes to education. If half the teachers in the school are ill and half the, and half the children in the school are ill, that becomes an incredibly difficult yeah. thing and to And that's going to happen. That is going to happen. And unfortunately... And you get off sick then. Uh, you, this is why we COVID. have to change our approach. Well, I think very soon, Rebecca, we're probably going to have to take a different approach when it comes to that. Go because, in school with COVID. Well... Uh, going anywhere with COVID because very soon, as this becomes endemic, let me tell you, we won't have supermarkets open. We won't have restaurants open. If it is and mild... we can't starve. Yeah. So very but soon, we're is... going to have to start changing our if approach. If it is super mild, then fine. I'm fine with that. If it is like it was with Delta, where people lose their tense of taste and smell and long COVID is a thing and all that hoopla, then realistically, we are going to have to think really radically about what we do next. Yeah, look, uh, the only facts we know about Omicron are it's 30% milder than mm. any other variant well, as, we've as, had as so Ken far. Livingston's dead on this show last night, and I think he laid out what the socialists want, perpetual lockdowns. I say hell no to that. Now, global travel restrictions, keeping families apart from each other, has been one of the most shameful side effects of COVID and should never be allowed to happen again, in my view. Thankfully, there was some rare common sense on display from the Health Secretary Sajid Javid today as he announced the UK's travel red list has been scrapped because it wasn't effective in stopping Omicron spread. Funny that. Uh, well, one family who are grateful for the easing of the cruel and pointless travel restrictions is Brie Benfell. Now, the 35-year-old, who is based in Singapore, had an emotional reunion with her dad after two and a half years apart, where their family was finally able to meet their 18-month-old daughter, Theodora. Take a look. Coming up, has the world become so topsy-turvy that Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn, mm. could now be a voice of reason? How freezes over as we look at the nominees for today's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. But first, here's what's coming up in tomorrow's show. Coming up on Dan Wooten Tonight, former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey breaks his silence to reveal the truth behind his Tory Christmas party storm and whether he feels thrown under the bus. Are the BBC running scared of Harry and Meghan? Royal author Robert Jobson weighs in on Crown Jewels. Plus, two of our favourite members of the GB News family, Brendan O'Neill and Rod Little, sound off on issues the MSM won't touch. And I'll break down the day's top stories with my superstar panel. Making his debut, the hospitality champion and social media sensation Adam Brooks, the Daily Mail star columnist Amanda Patel, and the royal and political commentator Daisy McAndrew. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm on GB News. Time now, though, to reveal today's greatest Britain and Judy and Jackass. The superstar panel are back with me, Dawn Neeson. Who's your nomination for Greatest Brit tonight? For Greatest Brit, it is every single one of the 99 rebel MPs yeah. who voted for democracy. They represented the people who voted for them, the people about the position of power, and they rebelled against the weak and pathetic Boris Johnson, and backed up by his deputy, Keir Blumenstarmer. <laughs> 
Good nomination. Kelvin, uh, this is the one I think that might shock a few people tonight. <laughs> My greatest Briton today, Dan, is Jeremy Corbyn. And I never thought I would say this, but <gasps> say I agree. Say it ain't with, so. I agree with Jeremy Corbyn. No. <laughs> because he was standing up opposing the vaccine passports. Quite right, too. I mean, he is the kind of guy that opposes anything. But, but <laughs> yeah. thankfully, he opposed this. <laughs> I never thought I'd see the day. Hell has just frozen I, I agree. Over. I agree as well. I, I don't need to lie down. Rebecca Reid, your nomination. Look, it was very slim pickings this week, so in a very Islington dinner party move, I've gone for the writers of Succession, because if you haven't seen the finale, most recent episode, it is such incredible writing. That's the best I could come up with, I'm afraid. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I, look, I, I haven't seen the finale. I haven't seen the finale. I, I'm two episodes away from it. Uh, but I think this series has sucked. The first two were very, very, very slow. The, yeah. they def the, this one is beautiful writing. It's really picked up. I think it's been useless, but look, I'll, I'll go for the two episodes to see. OK, well, my winner is Dawn Neeson. I completely agree. Again. The rebellion <laughs> heroes, especially <laughs> the Tory rebels, because, you know what? They are now yeah. our official opposition. Uh, all right. Uh, let's move on to our Union Jackass time. Dawn Neeson, your nominee. Well, I think I might be on a winner here oh. as well with you, Dan. This one is Nicola Sturgeon, Hitler in a frock, north of the border. A woman that is getting off on power and is basically just locked down Scotland again. Although it's up to you. It's up to you who you see and where you go and open the windows in Scotland in December. Good luck. <laughs> I know. She, she's infuriating, isn't she? Calvin, your nomination for Union Jackass. Um, Sajid Javid, because he said that the most important mm. reason for a face-to-face -face meeting with your GP is to get the booster. Forget if you've got undiagnosed cancer, forget if you've got mental health issues. The most important reason is for the booster. He sounds like a used car salesman pushing drugs and it's inappropriate and it's, you know, the wrong tone. And your nomination, Rebecca Reed. Yeah, so I just went Matt Hancock, but this isn't based on policy. <laughs> this isn't you? based on, on any of his actions. This isn't based on the whole scamming on someone else's wife during a pandemic. It's purely sartorial. It's based on the outfit that he wore to Capitol's Jingle Bell Ball, it's because that is an unforgivable Steve Jobs cosplay, <laughs> and he should be ashamed of himself. <laughs> Yeah, I can we just have another look at that? Oh, Why the, was he that, at the Jingle Bell Ball? He I, is not a member of Little Mix. I know. Can we just have another look at the outfit? Because it, it, it was quite something, wasn't it? There's it was... no long shot for you to see the trainers, but he is wearing trainers with wide leg jeans and a polo neck. Just... I think we did have a long shot. I think we did have a long shot. I can shot. live with it's that. It's the oh. Matt Hancock rebrand, doesn't it? Look there at it. it is. Oh. Look at that. Do you know what? It is just such a perfect example of a politician who seemingly has no idea, Calvin, that the best thing they could possibly do is just stay out of the limelight. Well, he was putting his name in the mix as the potential future leader of the party. That's how disconnected from the general public he is. That's very but fine. But he's trying, he's doing the, he wants to do the Ed Balls thing where you make people love yeah, you yeah. by being a bit funny and silly. Yeah. And I think we've moved on from that. Snogging your mistress is not a good idea. It's not a good start, yeah. is it really? I then? fully don't care that he snogged someone I don't know, would you, would you, that offend, This outfit offends, the offends me more than that. Would, would, you, would you snog him ever? Do you know what? There was you a time where I didn't hate it. What? You think yeah. general anaesthetic? I don't think he's that bad looking. It's just that oh, outfit makes me want to pull my oh. eyes out. <laughs> well, what a fabulous superstar panel tonight. I'm going with Matt Hancock, of course. He's yeah. my union jackass most days. Finally. Well done, Rebecca Reed. And thank you so much, Rebecca Reed, <laughs> Dawn Neeson, Calvin Robinson, for taking us through what has been a very busy news day. Thank you so much for your company too. I'm of course back tomorrow night at 9 p.m. with all of the repercussions of that big vote, which is going to put Boris under major pressure. Headline is, is next. See you tomorrow night. Good night. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi there, welcome to the latest forecast. There'll be a lot of cloud during the next 24 hours, shrouding the hills of western UK and keeping things mild. There'll be some rain as well, but that will tend to ease later as this area of high pressure moves in for the rest of the week and begins to properly settle things down widely.
before that happens. These weather fronts and these tightly packed isobars across northern parts of the UK bring wind and rain for Tuesday evening. Some heavier rain at times.